Welcome back, beautiful and amazing human beings. This is Luke Radowski of WeAreChange.org, and today we are joined by Partisan Girl all the way halfway across the world in Australia. And of course, she's joining us for our We Are Change news show. And we're going to do something different. Since me and Partisan Girl and pretty much predominantly all of the other alternative independent media have been getting screwed by YouTube in favor for the mainstream media, we're going to act like the mainstream media and talk about two of the most uh, pushed on stories, most promoted stories today that is being generated by the mainstream media before actually getting to the real news that actually matters, that is actually important in your life and the world's life. Uh, are you ready for this partisan girl? Are you ready for the number one story talked about today by the U.S. mainstream media? All right, the first one is a U.S. actor, Jim Carrey, is criticized for his, quote, monstrous portrait that is believed to be the White House press secretary, Sarah Huckabee Sanders. So, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, uh, yeah, 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 what do you think? <laughs> I mean, I, like, I just did a doodle of Sarah Huckabee, and one <laughs> they want to interview me about this portrayal. Uh, call me. You know my spot, you have my Twitter. I'm ready to talk. <laughs> I mean, yeah, yeah. A US actor drew a mean did you see the photo? Did did I, I just said oh, just... no, I no, I just you just sent it to me. And yeah, did you see it? Yeah. I mean, you know, we're told that really there's no such thing as ugly and there's no such thing as beautiful. So I think that they're shaming this portrait. This is like ugly yeah. shaming. Yeah, yeah, and uh, and uh, distracting everyone from the real important news that's actually <laughs> happening because it's only an actor who drew a mean photo of a politician. But yeah, regardless, second story, <laughs> the second story that's being talked about today in the U.S. mainstream media that's being pushed on everyone is how the Sex and the City star, Cynthia Nixon, is now officially running for governor of New York. So yeah, uh, another celebrity running for high elected office here yeah, in the United and States. Nixon well another nixon there's there's nothing yeah. wrong that the, that could go with this scenario <laughs> at all i mean what could go wrong with celebrities being politicians no i mean how many presidents were celebrities i mean trump that other guy that there was an assassination attempt what was his name i don't know it doesn't like, he was an actor reagan he, reagan there you go yeah so, so yeah. actually it's not really news because I think most of these most of these politicians are probably just actors. So, so yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, pretty much Washington is uh, Hollywood, but for ugly people, as many people say. So, uh, yeah, we have. But I'm sure uh, that people, the women, are going to vote for her. Yeah, because she I'm, has female genitalia. Yeah, she's she's probably going to win. So, uh, mm -hmm. yes, uh, we're going to have uh, Sex in the City star uh, as governor of New York very soon. We'll yeah. be able to watch all her antics on our television screens as she's issuing government policy. So yeah, more uh, actors going to uh, politics. So yeah. So now that um, we have our clickbait titles uh, <laughs> that YouTube will, of course, promote us for, uh, since we're talking about these very important issues, now let's get into the actual news, World War Three. <laughs> well, not actually World War Three, but the bigger geopolitical foreign policy news that's happening that, of course, we cover here, that Partisan Girl has been covering for a number of years now and breaking down. I mean, even uh, major outlets like Reuters and the BBC are talking about the doomsday clock moving closer to the supposed apocalypse. Even Huffington Post wrote a piece recently saying how World War III could already be started right now. And of course, there's a lot of salacious kind of fear mongering and kind of clickbait titles. But in reality, we do have to kind of step back and look at the bigger picture of things away from the celebrities and away from the bullcrap because there is a lot of stuff brewing that people should know about, like the very fact that the Israeli military military right now is simulating and preparing for drills and exercises that are simulating a full frontal war with Russia intervening Israel from attacking Syria. So as we're speaking right now, Israel is quietly practicing 
the possibility of war with Russia. And this is just on the heels of a joint exercise that Israel did with the United States called Jupiter Cobra, a very fitting name, uh, simulating more war in the Middle East. Uh, Partisan Girl, what do you think about all of this saber rattling, all of this kind of preparedness that's happening right now in the Middle East and it escalating to the proportions where it is right now? Well, I'll tell you what I said in the Facebook post that got my Facebook account deleted, the last post I ever made. But the war with Israel is not only possible, it's inevitable. So it's only really a matter of time. And the problem is, of course, that Israel, the Israeli lobby in the US is very strong. Um, APAC, it's got basically tentacles in both the Republicans and the Democrats. Um, the president's son-in-law, he has a very tight relationship with Netanyahu. And the alliance between the US and Israel is quite obvious. So in order to um, allow Israel to continue uh, breaking international law, unfortunately, it might be the case that the U.S. is going to start World War III on their behalf, and which will result in millions of deaths, American ones as well. So uh, right now, with this possible World War III scenario, I think that we are living in a time where it's more likely that there's going to be a nuclear war, even more so than it was during the Cold War. And if you look at the nuclear posture report that Trump came out with uh, before anything, he said, not him specifically, but the US government came out with this nuclear posture report that said that there's a possibility that they will use tactical nuclear weapons. It's all online. I, it's it's open, you know, it's not even classified. They will use tactical nukes, small nukes are a possibility. Now, in answer to that, Putin made a statement that uh, if the U.S. were to use a nuclear weapon of any size on anywhere, Russia will take this as the beginning of nuclear war and launch everything at once. And he also stated that Russia has this new um, device that they've been working on, which will be un- unstoppable for a um, this Star Wars system that's supposed to shoot down nuclear weapons. So the the idea that the Trump administration had was that if now we're at now they have this possibility of using small tactical nukes probably on Syria um, and perhaps North Korea and nothing will happen to them and Putin's come out and said well um, no even if there was a retaliatory strike they'd be able to shoot it down and Putin's sort of blown that out of the water but whether or not they believe him is the question and whether or not they're going to try it anyway is the other question because right now on the news and we've heard reports from soldiers inside the bases in Syria is they are on alert that in 48 hours there might be an attack by the U.S. against Syrian forces. This is when Al-Qaeda is being defeated in Ghouta um, near Damascus. It's on the, they're on their last leg. Um, and, you know, all of this report, these fake reports that um, just in word, they just said this possibility of chemical attacks. And instead of having a false flag in Syria, we saw it in the UK, in Salisbury, but that's another story. Um, And all of this banter about possibility of attacking Syria is happening in the background. So this chance that the US is gonna attack Syria is strong. And the position that they would attack it is um, on the border of Iraq and Syria, because there's a town along the river where ISIS still is, Um, this is the area where ISIS still exists, that the Syrian government took this town that the U.S. wanted instead. The reason that town is very important is because it links Syria and Iraq together, and hence it allows them to continue to um, sell or um, have a link to Iran to get weapons across in case there's a war with Israel. So the U.S. wanted to basically block and isolate Syria from Iraq and Iran, and that's why that town is important. And if, if an attack is going to happen, it might just be there. Or, you know, it might be an all-out war, such as the war games have been doing, where it's going to be Russia, Iran, Syria against the U.S. and Israel. But I'm, I'm, 
yeah, I'm, I'd like to get your take on that. Well, well, hopefully it doesn't happen. We've been seeing the posturing and the strong words against each other from a very, very long time now. I mean, we're talking about decades ago, there's been tensions between Syria and the United States and Israel. So this is a conflict that is building up. But from my analysis within the last few years, it is crescendoing. It is escalating. We can only hope that there won't be mutually assured kind of destruction. It is very interesting to see how Russia is kind of stepping up and kind of being uh, the middle person obviously protecting their interests, but obviously also making sure that the United States doesn't overstep their kind of power in the region alongside Israel. And there's been a lot of stern kind of talking between Israel and Russia. And I think that's why Russia um, right now understands that when it comes to protecting Syria, uh, they're going to also have to face heads with uh, Israel, with the United States, and of course, Saudi Arabia, which I wanted to bring up to you and kind of kind of fall, flow along with kind of the news that we're talking about here. Because as we're talking right now, we have the Saudi Crown Prince visiting the United States on a two-week U.S. trip. Now, obviously, there's a lot of uh, uh, foreign policy there's a lot of domestic, there's a lot of international news surrounding Saudi Arabia, uh, but also economically, uh, the bigger factor here really needs to be addressed too, because Saudi Arabia is going bankrupt. They cannot survive economically, and I think that's why we're seeing the Saudi Crown Prince meet with the heads of Uber, Amazon, GE, and other American companies as Donald Trump is trying to lobby Saudi Arabia to sell their oil on the New York Stock Exchange. We saw the Saudi Crown Prince on 60 Minutes just yesterday, which many critics say was just a total embarrassment and a total uh, failure in journalism since the journalist failed to kind of counter some of the points that the Saudi Arabian prince was making. This is all on the heels of Trump's administration trying to scramble and make sure that Congress does not stop the U.S. involvement in the Yemen war that Saudi Arabia has started, that the U.S.'s involvement, all on the heels of the latest news that we're getting from the Washington Post that Donald Trump actually tried to have a deal with Saudi Arabia for $4 billion that would allow U.S. troops to leave the Syrian northeast region in exchange from Saudi Arabia investing infrastructure and taking over their presence, making sure that Russia and Iran don't gain an influence on that very strategic oil reach uh, region of northeast uh, Syria. So I was just wondering to get kind of your kind of point of view on uh, Donald Trump acting like the real estate mogul, but right now for uh, Syria. Well, just to, to be clear, I haven't watched the 60 Minutes interview and I, I only recently heard about this uh, oil deal that might be coming up. It's, it's, of course, against international law to try to sell off land that isn't yours. And the U.S. is currently occupying 80 percent of Syria's oil infrastructure. So it's, um, of course, they're using the Kurds as uh, a, a reason for that, um, even though they're allowing Turkey to invade the north of Syria and kill basically their allies. But, but it seems kind of ridiculous to me to even think that Saudi Arabia could possibly survive in the north of Syria. I mean, they couldn't even defeat these militias in Yemen, the Houthis. And the Houthis have actually encroached into Saudi Arabia. So I can't see how Saudi Arabia could um, even compare to the might of the Syrian Russian and Iranian militaries. So um, the only thing is, though, the Kurdish forces in that area, the SDF, said that a few months prior, maybe perhaps five months ago, they said they were ready to cooperate with Saudi Arabia. And the reason is that if you remember at the beginning of uh, the U.S. elections, Trump said that Saudi Arabia is the biggest sponsor of terrorism in the region. He wrote a book about how Saudi Arabia are the ones behind everything. Um, and now he kind of made statements to that effect when he first came into power but then Saudi Arabia began making a lot of deals with him um buying weapons i think you know uh, uh, agreeing to a lot of policies on Syria which included balkanization which is the reason why Saudi Arabia is enemies now with Turkey and Qatar whereas before they were like a gang that were ganging up on Syria now there's some friction between them. And that's also the region, reason why these Kurdish militias are interested in working with Saudi Arabia now, because they are kind of on board 
with Israel and the U.S. and their policy in Syria 100%. Um, and of course, they continue to fund these terrorist groups that the U.S. is still on the side of. And, you know, it's interesting that at the United Nations, um, Nimrata, or as you know her, Nikki Haley, uh, she said, she had, they basically admitted that, yes, Al-Qaeda is in Wuta, in, the, on, in that pocket in Damascus right now. But you wouldn't hear that in the U.S. media, and you wouldn't even know about it because they continue to defend these opposition fighters, as they call them. So now they've changed their name from rebels to that. But back onto Saudi Arabia, I mean, of course, they need to polish the image of Saudi Arabia because everybody knows that the, the entire Middle East, Saudi Arabia has the most regressive policies, the most archaic uh, kind of extremist versions of Islam. If, you, if you're a Christian, you're not allowed to celebrate uh, Christmas openly. Um, you basically have Women were not allowed to drive. Now they've made them change that law. Now they say he's saying that he's emancipating women. I mean, call me when women can wear sleeveless shirts in Saudi Arabia because they haven't gotten to that yet. But they're making it out to be that this Saudi prince is now, um, you know, it, what's next? Is he going to stop beheading people in the street? We're yet to see that. But of course, this it's part of like polishing the image of Saudi Arabia now they're no longer the terrorist sponsors. Now they're the greatest allies that the U.S. has ever had. And to be honest with you, the U.S. has always been their ally because at the end of the day, they don't really care about whether they support extremists or dictatorships in the Middle East. They only care about destroying, rebuilding, to get these contracts for rebuilding, and stealing the resources and protecting Israel. That's all they really um, care about. So, of course, it's no surprise that Saudi Arabia would be their greatest ally while they pretend to be against Islamist terrorism. Yeah, the alliances here are very interesting because they keep kind of shifting as well, specifically when we're talking about Turkey here, uh, which is a NATO state, but has effectively also pissed off the United States, is attacking their allies, but at the same time is somewhat wavering between supporting Russia and the United States at the same time as they're going for their power grab and their kind of land grab that we're seeing right now in the north of Syria. We also see Saudi Arabia being pissed off at the United States for effectively uh, naming Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. So we're seeing like a lot of little different posturings, but also I kind of see Saudi Arabia backing down uh, from their kind of close entanglement with the United States, even though it's primarily been Israel and Saudi Arabia that the United States has been acting in behest of, especially with their foreign policy. But the alliances here, especially with the Kurds and Turks, is just so surmountable. It's so back and forth, it's hard to even keep in touch with what exactly what, what's happening there. I'm very happy you brought up the kind of flip-flop that uh, Donald Trump made when he was running uh, to be president and now that he's president with Saudi Arabia. This, of course, has made many people speculate that there actually is a deep state and it's not Donald Trump who's fighting them, but it's Donald Trump who's a part of them, which leads to the last article that I wanted to talk to you about. And it's an article showing how a majority of people now in the United States believe that there is a deep state that is, quote, manipulating policy. And this was a question asked to hundreds of people in the United States. And this question was uh, said that it was described as a collection of unelected officials that were actually running policy behind the scenes. And seven out of 10 Americans believe that this is the case. And I wanted your point of view. Do you believe that this is the case? And do you believe Trump is either a part of them or fighting them? Uh, I 100% believe it's the case. And unfortunately, I don't think Trump is fighting them. I think that he probably annoyed them because he used populist tactics to take over from what um, basically Hillary Clinton was supposed to be the chosen person and that became difficult to put her into power. Um, I think that they're bothered by him, but only because they want to make sure that he's constantly under pressure to do exactly what they want. Um, and that's why you're seeing things against him in the media. He's basically doing everything that the deep state wants. There's, I don't see anything that he's done that so far that really stands in their way. And um, the deep state is in control. And the best thing that happened 
by the fact that Trump got into power is that it made that clear to the American people. And now 70% of people believe that it is the case, um, whereas before it might have been in, you know, a conspiracy theory. But now it's quite clear. He came in with all of these ideas that people supported, like no more regime change in the Middle East, more isolationist policies, and he's backflipped on all of his issues. And it just makes it up so clear that there's a deep state and they control the media as well. There's so much history here. There's so much context. There's so much latest news even right now to follow up. So I, I thank you for your analysis. I thank you for your breakdown and your understanding of what you're seeing uh, and what you kind of understand from the kind of bigger picture uh, from, of course, your perspective. And if you want more from Partisan Girl, definitely follow her on Twitter.com forward slash Partisan Girl. Her YouTube channel will, of course, be in the description of this video. And of course, Thank you, beautiful and amazing human beings for allowing independent media to be alive and survive and thrive with, of course, your donations and participation on wearechange.org forward slash donate. Partisan Girl, thank you again so much for being on the show. I really appreciate you. And let's, let's, let's do the hour-long podcast. We have a whole hour-long podcast. Let's get into all of it. Let's get into uh, the history of the Middle East. And uh, we could do a whole marathon live stream probably on that with our understandings of it and the historical context of everything that people need to understand uh but uh, regardless thank you again so much for your perspective and thank you so much for joining us here on we are change